So our next speaker is Justin Azoff, and he is presenting uh, the the third year in a row the Justin Azoff's laboratory, which is all the things that he's been working on in the last year, and he's got something new to share today. Like four things new. Today. He's got four new things to share today. So welcome, Justin. Okay, I don't. Ah, uh, awesome. Well, that comes later. Okay. So, uh, quick show of hands, who has ever been helped by either the, what did we call it, the Bro Center for Expertise or me personally on the mailing list? Definitely helped a lot of people in the past year or two that we've been kind of trying to do help officially. One thing I started working on recently was trying to automate this help. Because often when we start uh, an engagement, we ask the same couple of questions, you know, check this log file, check this setting. And a lot of it is very mechanical. So as of yesterday, and Jeanette is the Twitter wizard. I'm, I'm really tweeting. OK, she'll be tweeting a second. I have a new package called Bro Doctor, which you can bro package install Bro Doctor. Uh, run it on your production machine. And when you run it, you have to run doctor.bro for now. Uh, you will get output. Oops, we need color flags. You'll get output that looks something like this. So just before I came up here, I started a Bro Cluster on my laptop. And I purposely configured it not quite right. So right off the bat, you can see it's complaining about a couple of things. So as it turns out, wireless on the Mac doesn't do checksum offloading. So my connections seem to be OK. But apparently, I don't even have a capture loss log file. I think we might turn this on by default now. But older Bro installations don't have it. And if you never re-went through local.bro, so right off the bat, it'll tell you if you don't have capture loss you really want to load this in your local .bro. Uh, my laptop is handling my connections pretty well, so zero of my connections, so capture loss. Actually, apparently I had zero connections so far. Um, something is up with that, but laptops are not really what this is designed for. Um, one next thing that it checks is bro ships a couple of config files by default that we're going to be hopefully removing really soon, and really no one should be putting anything in them. A lot of problems that we see with really odd cluster issues are because you put something in local log or local manager, local proxy. So this tool will check if you have anything in those files that is not a comment line. And I put print hybrocon in my file. Um, this next check it does is kind of interesting. I, I purposely configured this laptop to use uh, lbprox, even though it's not going to work right, because it's not set up for that. So it's telling me that 100% of my connections are duplicates. So every connection that's in the con log is logged twice because it is not configured properly. It's really a common problem when someone thinks they're using PFRing or Miracom and load balancing, and they tell Bro, run 16 workers. And the next question, there's usually two questions. Like one, why are all my CPUs at 100%? And two, why do I have everything logged multiple times? It's it's one problem in the two ways. So this will flag that pretty quickly. Uh, there might be some false positives on like five tuple reuse. But if you're running eight workers and you have a couple of connections twice, you could probably ignore it. But if you're running eight workers and it tells you every connection is eight times, something is not quite right. Um, does anyone see the recent, uh, I think Seth on Corelight wrote a blog post on why you should use whatever they're calling TC malloc or dperf. Gperf tools, it's, it's package is weird. So if bro is not linked against uh, a custom malloc, you will get uh, this message, configure to use a custom malloc false. So really, everyone should be using JE malloc or TC malloc, because for heavily threaded programs like bro, it runs a lot better. Uh, the next thing is, uh, this is why we have duplicate traffic, is because I told bro to use pfring, but this is the Mac. It doesn't actually have pfring. So because the config reference pfring, it LDD'd, or on the Mac, it's otool, the bro binary. And it's not actually using pfring, so there's the mismatch. So you either can't be configured, and you shouldn't be using pfring. The other thing it'll check if you're actually built against pfring, but you never actually told it to use it in your node config, you're probably missing out. So it'll complain about that too. And the other thing it'll do will, will flag uh, the reporter.log, which there's a lot of problems that'll really only show up in reporter.log, like input file issues that come and check some issue, which I expected to show up. But apparently on the Mac, 
wireless, they don't do, I guess, hardware checksums on the Thunderbolt display that worked just fine when I tested this the other day. Um, so yeah, so that's Bro Doctor. Um, I've like doubled the number of checks in the past day or so. And in the couple of people that I talked to, everyone suggested more things to try. So I would suggest, you know, try it on a cluster, especially if one's not working quite right. And uh, let me know what you see. Let me know if it blows up. If you know you did something wrong in the past and you wish Bro would have told you about it, you know, file a bug on the GitHub repo and I will add a check for it. It's kind of designed, there's just check function after check function of things that we can check for and try to solve problems when they start as opposed to running for weeks and weeks and weeks with a broken cluster. Um, so that's Bro Doctor. Any questions on that? Has anyone installed it yet? Awesome. <laughs> well, I had you install it the other day. So yeah, so we, I had a couple of my coworkers that run Bro at home, and it actually, on a very simple single node Bro cluster, it's you know, pretty much green across the board, which is great. On, uh, we've been actually using some of the output to debug some cluster problems with some tapping issues, where it tells us that you know, half of our connections are sad, which is never a good thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff I can plan to do for this. Is a lot of the problems it'll tell you, like configure to use a custom malloc false. Like I know what that means, but I realize there really should be a kind of verbose explanation on how to actually fix that. But it's at least a starting point of something to look at or mention on the chat or the mailing list. Like, hey, this says I should be using a custom malloc. What does that mean? But uh, so that's Bro Doctor. It's uh, off to a good start. Uh, not much to it. OK, what did I say? All right, uh, next. Great. I'm trying to stay in order with the links that I told you to send out. Um, let me bring up uh, GitHub. That comes in a second. Uh, another thing I published, uh, bro interface setup. Another really simple bro control plugin called bro interface setup solves the common problem of you set up a bro cluster, but you're either your MTU is too low or you forgot to turn off all the um, checksum offloading. So this is a simple plugin that you can just throw on your manager in Bro, and it'll deploy it to all the workers. And when the workers bring up the interfaces, Bro Control will bring up the interface, set the MTU, turn off all the checksum offloading. So it just, it's just one thing that's such a pain. And with this plugin installed, you just never have to deal with it. And as of yesterday, I have the comment that tells you apparently what to do if you use FreeBSD, because the flags are slightly different. Otherwise, it should work on both platforms. So that's Bro Interface Setup. Really simple plugin, really easy to use. OK, trying to go through here. Uh, and also, as of yesterday, I finally published my scan code, including I split out the darknet function, which I don't know what I just did there, which is a very simple function, but really hard to get right, because a lot of people do dark nets differently, I learned. Uh, sometimes you have a dedicated area of your network that's dark net. Sometimes you don't, but you kind of know where your unallocated space are. And sometimes you do have a dark net, but you also use it for honey net purposes, so it's not truly dark. So this plugin has um, four different modes you can run uh, the darknet code in. Uh, sometimes a useful one is darknet and not allocated, which I used to have this problem. We had darknet address space, and then someone would be like, oh, we need this subnet for this conference that's coming. Let me just reallocate it. And now Bro thinks all of this traffic is scan traffic, and you've caused a huge problem. So this mode will figure out that that subnet's not now allocated and ignore it from the uh, darknet checking. And uh, it has B tests and everything. So there's a couple of different test cases for all the different modes that ensure that if you told it it's darknet. And it's, it's for something that I thought was very simple, it turned into a rather complicated um, script to write and to test. It ended up with there's this massive switch statement to handle all the different cases for how people do networking. And the reason why I wrote this is because I also published the scan detection code we're using, which one of the things that it really wants to know is, is the destination address darknet or not? 
So with that information, scan detection can be better. Um, so if you've used the scan ng that Ashish wrote, Ashish, this is very similar to that, where that was probably, what, like five years of experience going into that, making scan detection work and updating the old code, where this was me kind of looking at and saying, if we started from scratch, what's the simplest possible scan code that we could write to do scan detection, be simple to understand, be a good base for other scripts? So that's this scan code. It comes into just under 300 lines. It's probably not perfect, but it's, I think, simple enough and easy enough to understand that I even put a comment in here that uh, the above 17 lines need to be factored out into functions, hook, or something pluggable. I basically just gave up on that. And if this doesn't do what you want, just fork it and change these 17 lines, which is really all of how it decides if something is a scan. So if you're really interested in scan detection, that's your thing to use. OK, what did I say I would talk about next? Um, how much time do I have? Three hours. You have uh, 34 minutes. Uh, thir three or four minutes. All right. Um, OK, I will skip that. I'll come back to that. So there's actually a lot of overlap in this conference, which is really good this year. Everyone is doing log analysis, which is great because we can compare notes after the conference. Um, a tool that I've been working with, and I just open source some of the scripts, is this software called ClickHouse. There's this company called Yandex. They're basically the Russian Google that wrote this really amazing column store database. So similar to those parquet files that were just being talked about, or even like the arrow stuff, column stores are way faster for doing any kind of log analysis. And they open sourced it. Like it's effectively what kind of Google uses with their like big query or kind of stuff. But you can actually run it locally. So if you have issues with uploading you know, a terabyte of bro logs to Google, or you can't pay for it, you can run ClickHouse just on a server. So if I didn't lose it and lose my connection, I should have it here. OK, so let me make this bigger so you can read. So to give you an example of the, some of the things it can do, let's see how much uh, con log data I have in this system. So that'll take a minute or so, because to do this basic query, it's able to read our con records at 500 million rows a second, which is kind of cheating because counts like this are really fast. So this table has 8 billion rows in it. And you know, lots of queries like that are almost just as fast. If I say, what day, because there's, actually, let's figure out how many days. We can say unique day from con. How, how far back does this data go? And you can see it's a little slower. Uh, one way I could actually make it go faster is uh, sample the data uh, to say 1 25th. Sometimes you sample and it actually gets slower. Uh, so that runs, I'll talk a little bit about how this works. So there's kind of two choices for how to get data into a system like this. We could write a log writer or you know, use something like Kafka, pull out of Kafka right into this. But my problem was we had a year's worth of bro logs. And even if I wrote a log writer or got something going, it would be months before I could do anything useful. So I started out by just writing short little Python program that can take existing log archives and shove it into the system. And really, once you do that, you just run it every hour, and it keeps up to date. So there's some real-time things I could do with this uh, that I'm not really able to do because all of our logs are uh, an hour back, which is unfortunate. But uh, so far, it's good enough. didn't actually think this would take that long. I think in some aspects, sampling ends up being slower. I think you really need a factor of like 100 or 200. Um, because it actually takes more work to skip over the records than it does to just read all of them. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So in the Git repository, I have some scripts. One of them that's kind of useful, in theory, generates the schema. So you run it on a bro log, and it'll spit out effectively what you need. Because some of the log files, you can do enums, which are kind of a pain to keep up to date. But for the best performance, you want to list out if it's a certain number of fields, you list out all the options. You could just do a string, but de defining them as an enum. Some are easy. You know, auth success is either blank, true, or false. There's, I hope, not going to be a maybe in the future. But you know, cipher algorithm is likely going to change, and this is going to break. But uh, 
redefining an enum is a no op. It just adds another option. And then under example queries, I have a ton of queries that I've worked out that do some interesting things that I'll go through in a second. Like we'll show you guys this one in just a second. So I think that should be done. So 257 unique days worth of logs. And like if I did something like I want to look at every day from con where day is greater than, so just like the last month. And sorry for going so fast. I realize I've been doing SQL for almost 20 years, so I'm kind of good at SQL, and this is all SQL. So there we go. I just reported, I will zoom out and back in. I just reported on a month's worth of bro logs in five seconds at the rate of, you know, 160 million rows a second. So this has been a complete game changer for us. There's lots of ideas and queries that I think of that I want to do, but being able to run reports over a year's worth of logs was just prohibitive in the past. You just couldn't do it. You'd, you'd write the program and you'd wait, you know, eight hours or something for the program to run and you realize you typo something and you tweak it and then you come back in another eight hours with this. I can think of an idea like, you know, let's see how many unique originating hosts I've had in the past, per day for the past four days. And what's cool is that unique stuff uses very similar to like the hyper log log that Bro uses, so it won't blow up your memory. So I was able to just do this report really quick. One thing I've been just talking about, I noticed, um, I thought I had this in my history. One second here. Ah, yeah, SSH. So we also have our SSH logs. And with this, I could do reports over the entire year's worth of SSH logs. Oops, that wasn't the one I was looking for. Uh, ah, this is the one I was looking for. We noticed a drop off of SSH failures, and I was very confused about what happened. Um, that's not really the one I want either. Oh, one second. From SSH. Sorry about this. Oh, I put it in, it's even in the Git repository. SSH scanners per day. So this query will tell us how many non-successful SSH connections per day we've had for the last month. And that took a fifth of a second. Like, I can't even, like, zcat a month's worth of SSH logs in a fifth of a second. So you can see, for some reason, maybe due to the hurricane, we had a decent amount of SSH attackers per day, and then the past couple of days chopped in half. And another metric I have, it was a factor of 10. So, and just to show you, I can change this. If I remove and day, I could do the whole year. The whole year worth of SSH logs in five seconds. Good job, yeah. How big is Bastion? How big is what? Oh, okay, so yeah, I guess so this isn't Bastion, this is a different box. So this is the great thing. This is a VM with eight gigabytes of RAM. How many CPUs? One. So as far as I know, this will scale out to multiple CPUs and you can even run a cluster, but with this performance, the only thing I should say is this is using a nice NAS appliance over 10 gig Ethernet, but a box with like two SSDs. As you can see, the, the rate at which it was actually reading from disk was 390 megabytes a second. So, and even probably cached. Actually, I don't think it can even fit in RAM. I know it was two gigs, but it's, it's not that it's really cached. Yeah, uh, another question? Uh, I think we're running on top of ZFS with compression, but it does its own compression anyway. So I don't think the rig. So it was really interesting. I didn't think this would be that useful because our bro logs tend to be maybe like our SSH logs for the year or something like four gigabytes. If you uncompress them with gzip, it's like 40 gigabytes because gzip works really well. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, I might not be able to fit much data in this. We don't have tons of space lying around. When I loaded like four gigs of compressed bro logs into this, it ended up taking like five gigs. So I, you know, I expected, oh, it's gonna be you know, 40 gigabytes, but it's barely more 
than the actual size of the compressed burr logs. So which is, again, kind of the game changer. Uh, let me go through one more thing real quick, because it was actually super useful in an incident. Um, so we had a really bad phishing attack a couple of weeks ago. Uh, infected, well, I'll do the SSL one. Um, so we had a couple of addresses that we knew were compromised. And we wanted to find out, you know, what did they all go to that was in common? So first I just did the simple query, okay, find me every site that all five of these, five of these went to. And that immediately found everything. It found Google, it found Facebook, not very useful. So by doing this kind of complicated subquery, I was able to say, first, find me everything that these five sites had in common. Then from those candidate sites, tell me when was the first time they were seen and how many total people went to those sites. Then throw away everything that wasn't first seen today and was seen by fewer than 10 people. And that required us to look at you know, a month's worth of SSL traffic, um, which was, would be a lot of data on disk. But with this, it, I think it took longer to work out the query than it did for it to actually run. So as you can see, it's scanning only you know, 5 million rows a second. I'm looking at a lot of columns. And I believe if this still works, yep, it spits out. So these were the three SSL uh, subjects for the machines that were being contacted that only had those five machines in common that no one else was going to. And we were able to use this to find, I believe that's what the uh, infected SQL SSL follow-up is. Paste that. Now that I know that these are the bad subjects, just do another query to show me who actually connected to those. And it found, I think, one or two other machines that we didn't know about yet. So doing this sort of analysis, like I don't even know how to do this without either writing just the SQL query or writing a kind of long Python program and being able to crunch the month's worth of SSL data in, I think, how long did that query take to run? It was up here, 23 seconds. And anyone I think that's ever tried crunching, you know, months worth of bro logs before, I'm sure it's taken a lot longer than 23 seconds. So. So anyway, yeah, so there's the Bro ClickHouse repository on the NCSA GitHub. I know the tools are terrible. I kind of wrote them just to try this out. I didn't actually expect it to work as well as it did. Uh, this performance has kind of been a game changer for us. Um, I think I have made... I think you had a question over oh. here. Question? Uh, this is just assuming that you're archiving your logs as TSV and not JSON, correct? Correct. Uh, you just have to kind of rewrite the import tool the, the way I'm actually doing it is I parse the TSV, convert it to a friendly JSON format, and then just shove it into the API. Um, but yeah, rewriting that to support the JSON mode would be pretty easy. It would be less work. It's actually probably just delete most of the code that reformats it. I rename some of the fields, remove the dots, um, but otherwise, pretty straightforward. Oh, so I'll run one more query. One thing I noticed kind of interesting looking at our SSH logs is there's a couple of hosts that pretend to be putty but are clearly not putty. So right now I'm renaming anything that's putty underscore to just putty whatever because there's a lot of those. And then so once you run that, you see putty is not capital putty. Like I'm pretty sure the only official putty is capital P, lowercase u, capital TTY, like this one or this one at the bottom. All of these, all lowercase putty, putty with a capital P, putty with all capitals, are not actually putty. And so again, this was something, this query just, this was the entire year, you know, 75 million rows, it took 10 seconds. Like, there's reports that I've been running and learning things that I never would have been able to do before because thinking of an idea and running it over the year's worth of data it would be you know, 10 minutes per idea, an hour per idea. Now that this is down to 10 seconds per idea, I can just crank out ideas, think of different queries, look at different things, and get answers to questions that were impossible in the past. So, so that's ClickHouse. I'm very interested. There's another presentation, I think, tomorrow on using Bro with Spark. So it'll be really interesting. I had actually tried that first and just couldn't figure anything out. 
this I figured out in 20 minutes, so I went with this. It's possible that the Spark approach might be better in the future. You know, it's one less service to run. So I'd be really interested in comparing performance numbers. And how am I for time? You're doing great. Doing great. Well, I know I'm doing great, but how am I for time? You got 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Okay, so one last thing to talk about in demo. There's a project I've been working on as part of an NSF grant for shared intelligence and data sharing. And it really intersects a bit with Bro. Uh, so this component that I've been working on is really interesting. Is So like we saw in the previous talk at one point, there was the Kafka console consumer that just streamed the Bro logs out of Kafka. So like we have bro logs, like I could log into our bro server and tail our notice.log, but you can't tail our notice.log. We have some really cool notices about scanners and brute force attacks, but that's on our you know, cluster and you, because you're not us, you don't have access to it. But the problem is we'd love to share this data really with a lot of people. Um, so the tool I've been working on is effectively a very simple peer-to-peer -peer gateway that you can run on your network. You can teach it how to discover other nodes. It'll peer with other nodes. And at that point, it's very similar to Kafka. It's not bro specific. It's not security specific. It's just a bus. Uh, probably the biggest difference in Kafka is, so I have it running on this box for a while, if I can find it. After a month, it's using 5,500K of RAM. So kind of the opposite of Kafka for system resources. It doesn't do buffering. It doesn't do queuing. It's really just to get the data to other sites. If they're not online at the time, it just drops it on the floor. Because in theory, you have other ways to get archived data across. So you don't need terabytes of storage. You don't need gigabytes of RAM. You need five megabytes of RAM. So very easy to run. So here I have a demo. This is just a VPS in New York City. It's not on the NCSA network. It has no relation to the NCSA network. There's no SSH tunnel. There's no VPN tunnel. But it's running my gateway software. And it has a key, and uh, the NCSA system trusts that key. So they're connected. They're peered. And at NCSA, I'm putting bro logs into that system. So I run this sub command and do some shell stuff just to make it fit nicely on the screen here. And if I run that and just wait a couple of seconds, everyone stop scanning us right now. There we go. So that was, so now we got some data. I can zoom in a bit. So these are real-time scan alerts from the NCSA production bro cluster being encrypted, sent across the internet to my VPS in New York City and output to the screen. And if we're really lucky, I was able to work with ESNet yesterday which has, I believe, a much smaller footprint than we do. And in theory, it didn't crash and is still running. If it's really nice to us, I won't have to wait much longer. We should see data from other sites if it's going to be nice to us. Just scan yeah, can everyone just scan ESNet real quick? <laughs> we'll, we'll get lots of alerts. This will be really cool. There was, there was a lot of data earlier, but it might have, they might have stopped. They're here, right? Where's ESNet? Oh. Well, you'll have to take my word for it that this works. Um, one thing I can show is I do have some SSH HoneyNet stuff running from multiple sites. A very similar thing, not strictly Bro related, but we have exactly, almost exactly the same thing, uh, SSH, HoneyNet data streaming across. So this is um, a different system at NCSA, not even the Bro system, that's also publishing data into this peer-to-peer -peer network. And we get a real-time feed of uh, <coughs> SSH, HoneyNet data. It would be really cool if someone could scan ESNet. It's possible that they might have turned it off. Um, so it's actually kind of cool about this. So the integration already exists for tailing the bro logs and pushing into this. And I've been working. Oh, there we go, finally. So ESNet finally got scanned. So this is showing a, a real-time stream of bro notice events from clusters you know, in two different states being relayed to New York City in real time and aggregated with this tiny little gateway. 
in, in real time. So really anyone could run this, either if you're you know, a multi-state or multinational company and you wanna ship your bro logs around in real time and do some neat things with them, or maybe you're a RenISec member and you wanna share data with other RenISec sites. Um, think of kind of like, you know, like SIF or SES, but real time, no longer would you have to wait an hour to pull down the new feed to find out who the new scanners are? Now you can get the data in real time. So I could show you, it's not quite perfect yet, but there is a very simple example, I think, sub to Intel. So if I run that sub to Intel, anyone that's worked with the Intel file format should understand what this is. This is just the tab separated format that you need to use um, the files with Bro. So you can point Bro at this data, Bro will load this in in real time, and you will get an Intel log for other sites for their data. And you'd think there wouldn't be that much overlap, but I had this running at my house on my VPS, and I was getting scanners at my house that were hitting my VPS. So if two sites can show overlapping data, imagine what we can do with you know, 50 EDUs running this and participating or even companies. I think it's a lot easier to get EDUs to share data than companies. Um, so it's at least initially focused kind of at the like HPC and higher ed space, only because we kind of have the sharing models in place. But there's no reason why that if you had a, you know, bro clusters all around the country or all around the world, you could use this to aggregate data where something like Kafka could be uh, too heavy of a tool so I think I covered all the bits about the data sharing. Any questions on how that works? No. Uh, one thing I should mention, so it's all based on zero MQ sockets and their peer-to-peer -peer library. It's all using curved cryptography. So this problem is actually really easy to solve if you don't care about security and literally want to publish the data to everyone. As soon as you only want to publish the data to some people, it starts getting hard because now you have to deal with key pairs and encryption and access control. So almost all that's implemented. Um, every peer-to-peer -peer node has a directory of public keys, which allows them to connect to me. If I don't have their public key, they can't connect and they can't send me data. So fully encrypted with access control, safe. This is running over the public internet. There's no VPN. There's no... Uh, firewall security needed. You don't have to limit it to certain IPs. So it's, it's really designed to run. Oh, uh, I should also add, other than a small discovery service for introducing peers, there's also no central node. So there's nothing that could really go down and this data will stop flowing. So really there's no one in charge, there's no central node. Anyone can actually run a discovery service. It's not that like, there's one master discovery service. So it's really, if you're running this, you completely own the infrastructure. It's not reliant on a third party service to be working. Your data also only flows peer to peer. So the discovery service is only used to introduce two nodes. Once they're introduced, they talk directly. So your data isn't even flowing between other nodes. So you know exactly where your data is going. So that's the peer to peer data sharing project. Right. Uh, question back. So if you wanted to share different data sets through the same gateway, is there a way for it to dif any kind of thing to differentiate? Like, oh, I want the bro log data set, or I want some other data set, or do you have to do it on different? Uh, so the, the chat software has the concept of channels. I think it actually calls them groups. So yeah, so this is the bro group. Um, I can do the same thing and subscribe to the uh, SSH group and we'll get the SSH HoneyNet data. What's kind of not really implemented, mostly just because no one's really demanded it, is like per group access control. That starts getting into really complicated things that no one's even really asked for yet or might ever even need. So we figure right now if we're peering with someone, we trust them, we want them to access all the data. Once you start getting into subsets of the data, the, the code complexity will just balloon and we're not there yet. Right now it's really just, if we get to the point where there's a hundred sites on this all sharing data and we need to do more access control, we can look into implementing it. But right now there's like four sites on this and 
we're just trying to get the data. The, the last thing we would want is to start restricting the data when we're still just trying to get it to flow and get people using it. So like with this SSH HoneyNet data, we have an entire slash 16 running an SSH HoneyNet. And I'm sure a lot of people would love to have a slash 16 running an SSH HoneyNet. Well, you can have our data in real time. Uh, so it re really kind of changes things for like hoarding data. Like we are really actively trying to give it away. So, all right, any other questions on the data sharing? I think we have a lot of questions now on the data sharing. <laughs> Researchy, or can we actually get access to it? And uh, if so, how? It's, it's on GitHub. Um, it's all open source. Alex, is Alex here? Alex Withers, who's been working on the project with me, he's been working on the Ansible stuff. And I think it's to the point where he just has a script that you can run on a machine that sets up all the software and generates the keys. So yeah, it runs. If, if you're like in RenISAC and we um, you know, implicitly kind of already trust you, you could join today. Um, otherwise, if you just wanted to run this on your own network, you could run it today. It's a little tricky because we're kind of on the bleeding edge with some of the zero MQ stuff, adding encryption to some of the libraries. So they're really good at accepting pack patches. We're just adding these features and getting them working and they're kind of merging them in as fast as we ask them to. So there's, there's nothing you can like app get install to make this work because it's all development git branches and things like that. The way I've been testing it so far is I just built a static binary that just has everything and just works that you untar it and you run the binary and you're on the network because otherwise there's no chance anyone could get it built right now. But uh, so the repository I've been using for testing, oops, apparently I zoomed in was, uh, it's called P2P, oops, it's not on NCSA, it's on mine, called P2P test, which has everyone's currently known public key, a script to help you get started, and Gateway is just the binary. The actual repository, it ended up, it shouldn't be here, but I put it here for now. It's in, it's co-located with the discovery service, so called Simple Disco. So yeah, and it's, so it's all written in C using the C zero MQ libraries, which wouldn't have been my first choice, but they're pretty high level bindings. So you generally don't really ever see like malloc and things like that. You pretty much work with the high level abstractions. Uh, the last performance test I did, I set up two VMs on the East Coast, two VMs on the West Coast. And I think I just uh, copy and pasted one of these messages to just send. And I think I was sending 8,000 a second to you know, across the country, and it, I think, was using half a CPU. So, since our SSH HoneyNet, you know, sees a couple of records a second, we're probably good to scale this easily up to 50 to 100 sites before we start having to think about any optimizations. So, I think I answered the question in kind of a roundabout way. All right. Any oop, more questions? Great. I could talk about this all day. This is perfect. Anybody need an uh, open port to take advantage of this? Oh, yeah. So that is probably the biggest stumbling block is that the way this is designed it assumes full end-to-end -end connectivity. So you need an open port and with a publicly routable address. It kind of works behind NAT. As long as the other peers aren't behind NAT, it's really not the best situation. At least fortunately for us and the grant and everything that we've been working on is for securing science DMZs. So if you have a science DMZ, hopefully you have a public routable IP address. If you don't, you probably also don't have a science DMZ. So it at least works out well for us. Um, but yeah, that's, it's not optimal. One thing that I may enable is like public instances of the gateway. And then you'd only be able, you'd only need to connect outbound. Um, one of the nice things about running a gateway, I can show real quick. So if I uh, subscribe to this, so we see data. So let me just copy this command. So I can, oops, helps if I actually start screen and spell it the right way. So the gateway will also handle multiple clients. So once the data arrives at my VPS at the gateway, I can run as many of these uh, subscribers as I want 
and they all get the same data at the same time. So this way, you know, you run one gateway for your infrastructure, and Bro can talk to it, or Suricata can talk to it, or a HoneyNet can talk to it. If a public gateway was used, you'd be pulling down that data once for each client, which is what the point of the gateway is. But for smaller sites or sites behind firewalls, we might offer it. It's still kind of very new. Um, so yeah, as you can see, both of these windows are seeing the exact same data at the exact same time. Um, like we got ESNet on this. If they ran the sub command on their machine, they would see the exact same data that I'm seeing at the exact same time. So it's all very, uh, oops, I accidentally logged out. It's all very real time and pretty lightweight. So. So Rogue Doctor is, is on Twitter. Yes. Simple scan and the dark. Is Darknet? Yep. Darknet and Clickhouse. Yes. Oh, the peer-to-peer -peer data sharing. No, no, no. Sorry, the, the data warehouse. Now the uh, that Russian thing. That's Clickhouse. Yeah, Clickhouse. Yes, or as my team likes to call it, Clickhouse and Henhouse and mm -hmm. any sort of non-correct name you can think of. <laughs> so. so check out our Twitter if you want any. Little yes, stuff. all the links are there. Um, and yeah, so this is what I've been working. Oh, uh, one quick thing I forgot to mention and forgot to tell Jeanette. Someone asked me, I added uh, JSON support for my Bro passive DNS indexer code that I have. So if you have Bro logs archived and you don't have a passive DNS database, you can run this and get it up and running in about five minutes. And it'll index all your Bro DNS logs. And then you could find out what names we're using, what hosts. And finally, it works with JSON logs. Oh, and one last thing before I leave. So how many people know Bro can log as JSON? I know the person over there that asked me. Okay, of, of those people, wait, keep, keep your hands up. How many enable the JSON logs? This is interesting. So if, if Bro were ever to change the default, that could be good? Would people like that? I often wonder. Yeah, she's just like, no. <laughs> You, you have, what, 20 years of bro to have separated logs? The, the challenge is actually not the format, but looking at 300 gig of bro logs, looking for something using grep is kind of a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. and so at least if you get it out of ASCII, you can feed it into other things that make it much easier. Yes. I've, I've written probably the parser for the bro log in many different languages, and it gets old where JSON, everything works by default. So, but it does look like at least everyone that wants to use JSON is using JSON. I kind of feared at some point that people are cursing this weird tab separated file and they weren't even aware that there was just this one little line you add in your config and now you have JSON. Two lines? No, it's one line. The what? The timestamp. Oh, to configure the, yeah. No one can ever agree on how times are formatted, so. That's not, that's not going to be solved anytime soon. <laughs> so, all right, I think I am out of stuff and with two minutes to spare. So, perfect. One last question. Awesome. All right, thanks, Jeff. Great.